welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Orlando. The headlines. Mikhail Gorbachev, the last Soviet president who took down the Iron Curtain, dies at 91. Ukraine's President Zelensky hopes Zaporizhia plant will return under full Ukrainian control. Plus, Ukraine's emergency service releases video of drills in case of a radiation fallout. Good morning and welcome to the program. We begin with the news of Mikhail Gorbachev, the former Soviet leader who brought the Cold War to a peaceful end, his death. We begin with his death. He has died at the age of 91. Mr. Gorbachev, who took power in 1985, opened up the Soviet Union to the world and introduced a set of reforms at home. But he was unable to prevent the slow collapse of the Soviet Union from which modern Russia emerged. No tributes have been paid worldwide, with the UN chief Antonio Guterres saying he changed the course of history. The hospital in Moscow, where he died, said he had been suffering from a long and serious illness. In recent years, his health has been in decline and he had been in and out of hospital in June, international media reported that he had been admitted after suffering from a kidney ailment, though his cause of death has not been announced. All tributes have been pouring in from far and wide. U.S. President Joe Biden released a statement hailing him as a man of remarkable vision and sending his condolences. According to Mr. Biden, when Mr. Gorbachev came into power, the Cold War had gone on for nearly 40 years, and communism for even longer, with devastating consequences. Well, Mr. Gorbachev was brave enough to embrace democratic reforms and nuclear disarmament. Mr. Biden says these were acts of a rare leader, one with the imagination to see that a different future was possible and the courage to risk his entire career to achieve it. The result, he says, was a safer world and greater freedom for millions of people. Mr. Biden adds that even after leaving the Kremlin, Mr. Gorbachev remained deeply engaged and that people everywhere benefited from his belief in a better world. One of the most influential political figures of the 20th century, Mr. Gorbachev presided over the dissolution of a Soviet Union that had existed for nearly 70 years. When he set out his program of reforms in 1985, his intention had been to revive his country's stagnant economy and overhaul its political processes. All his efforts became the catalyst for a series of events that brought an end to communist rule, not just within the USSR, but also across its former satellite states. Internationally, Mr. Gorbachev wanted to end the Cold War successfully and negotiated with U.S. President Ronald Reagan then for the abolition of a whole class of weapons through the Mediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Well, a number of EU leaders have also paid tribute to Mr. Gorbachev after the announcement of his death. French President Emmanuel Macron said Mr. Gorbachev's commitment to peace in Europe changed common history. Irish uh, Michael Martin tweeted his condolences and hailed Gorbachev's commitment to openness, reforms and building bridges with the West. The Austrian Chancellor Karl Nehammer said the 91-year-old shaped the rapprochement between East and West after the fall of the Iron Curtain in Europe. And Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, Rutte uh, lamented the loss of what he called a courageous reformer with immense influence on history. Well, for the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, he's released a statement honoring the, quote, one of a kind statesman who changed the course of history. According to Mr. Guterres, Mr. Gorbachev did more than any other individual to bring about the peaceful end of the Cold War. The world has lost a towering global leader, committed multilateralist and tireless advocate for peace he concludes in his statement. Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin has also expressed deep condolences over the death of Mikhail Gorbachev. 
Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov says that Mr. Putin, in the morning, the president will send a telegram of condolences to Gorbachev's family and friends. Well, Mr. Gorbachev did not shy away from sharing his opinion of Vladimir Putin back in the day, toggling between light praise and rough critique. Well, he spoke to the BBC back in 2013 about how his relationship with Putin had soared since the former KGB agent took office in the year 2000. Uh, but in 2014, Gorbachev came to support the Kremlin's argument that NATO expansion in Ukraine was a threat to Russia. Mr. Gorbachev was a critic of Western sanctions and supported the invasion and annexation of Crimea. Well, away from the death of Gorbachev to uh, the situation in Ukraine itself, an international atomic energy agency car convoy has set off from Kiev towards the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in southeastern Ukraine. Well, uh, according to uh, reports, a day before they arrived, and President Volodymyr Zelensky had met with representatives from the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, in Kiev. Now, it's unclear when the IAEA mission planned to reach the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. The plant, which is the biggest in Europe, is now controlled by Russian forces and has become one of the focal points in the Ukrainian conflict, with Moscow and Kiev accusing each one of undermining its safety. Well, Ukraine on Tuesday accused Russia of deliberately shelling a corridor that IAEA officials would need to use to reach the plant in an effort to get them to travel via Russian and next Crimea instead. However, there's no, there was no immediate response from Moscow. Well, residents of the nearby town of Enohada expressed hope that IAEA mission would end the shelling. Well, speaking in his nightly, his usual nightly address, Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky said that representatives from the IAEA have uh, arrived in Ukraine and that they will be going to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in central southern Ukraine. That power plant had been captured by Russian forces in March, but still manned by Ukrainian staff. It's been a hot spot in the conflict with both sides trading blame for shelling in the vicinity. About two months ago, I spoke at four Minnesota. Well, President Zelensky has also met with uh, U.S. Senators Amy Klobuchar and Rob Portman in the capital, Kiev. Mr. Zelensky expressed his gratitude for America's support during the senator's visit. According to him, he's pleased to welcome the U.S. Sen senators Rob Portman and Amy Klobuchar to Ukraine. The bipartisan and bicameral support of Congress, according to the president, is extremely valuable to Ukraine. All gifts were exchanged following their meeting. Zelensky also urged Russian soldiers to flee for their lives after his forces launched an offense to retake southern Ukraine, but Moscow said it had repulsed the attack and inflicted heavy losses on Kiev's troops. Ukraine on Monday said its ground forces had gone on the offensive for the first time after a long period of aerial strikes on Russian supply lines, especially ammunition dumps and bridges across the strategically important river Dnipro. In response, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said on Tuesday that Russia was methodically pressing on with its plans in Ukraine, adding that all their goals have been reached or will be reached. While well, the Ukrainian counterattack comes after several weeks of relative stalemate in a war that has killed thousands of people and displaced millions, destroying cities and fueled a global energy and food crisis. Well, authorities in Ukraine have released the video showing what they say would be the drills in case of any radiation emergency. Footage showed rescuers conducting exercises, people in protective suits, washing cars and checking people for possible contamination. The video was released on State Emergency Service of Ukraine in the regional office. Uh, according to the original post, the rescuers worked out the algorithm to notify the civilian population, conducting training to use special equipment, including radiation control devices, and practice the decontamination of evacuees 
personnel, equipment and vehicles. A video uploaded on social media shows munitions being detonated as part of the Ukrainian counter-offensive fighting ongoing in the Kherson region. The location is given as near Andrivka, Kherson region in Ukraine. According to sources, the video is purported to show Russian shelling on Ukrainian positions. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is urging the Russian troops to flee even as his forces launched an offensive near the city of Kherson. Ukraine's offensive in the south comes after weeks of stalemate in the war that has killed many people and has brought about energy and food crisis amid unprecedented economic sanctions. We have joining us now Rory Finn, an associate pro professor of Ukrainian studies in Cambridge. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for standing by and joining us on the program this morning. Thank you for having me. Well, let's begin with uh, the news uh, making the rounds at this time, the death of Mikhail Gorbachev. It's uh, quite sad and interesting, you know, it comes at this time because he was a major force uh, in bringing down the Cold War during uh, for nearly 40 years ago. Gorbachev was uh, unmistakably a pivotal historical figure of the late 20th century. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's been very interesting, though, to um, examine and analyze the reactions of various political figures around the world to his passing, because his legacy is very mixed. And the reception of political leaders in Western Europe um, and those in civil society and politics in the countries neighboring Russia are vastly different. So Gorbachev is often thought of um, as a figure who indeed brought about the end of the Cold War rather unwittingly um, in his attempts to reform the Soviet Union through policies of perestroika, rebuilding of the Russian and Soviet economies, um, uh, glasnost or openness, openness for uh, civil society and democracy. Um, but all of those attempts to reform the Soviet Union failed, and we then saw the consequences. But um, that's an abstract take on his legacy. What uh, so many different people across Central and Eastern Europe, so-called, is a, a darker legacy, frankly. Um, if one looks at the legacy of Gorbachev in Ukraine today, he's often remembered for mismanaging the aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster, where millions across Europe and around the world um, were left to fend for themselves for days without the Soviet Union announcing that the catastrophe had taken place. They even let children parade in an irradiated Kiev um, while they fled to um, uh, Moscow and places farther afield. So um, the, the legacy there in Ukraine is, is quite dark. Uh, Gorbachev was also in charge in the Soviet Union when one of its major poets and civil society leaders, Vasil Stus, was killed in the Gulag. Lithuania, Latvia, um, we look at the uprisings there in 1991 that were violently put down um, that led to the deaths of 14 uh, people, for instance, in Lithuania. And we see that this notion of Gorbachev as an unmitigated advocate for peace is very complicated. Um, and I think those two different takes about Gorbachev's legacy tell us a lot about the different approaches to Moscow and the Kremlin right now, with Western Europe often thinking um, that uh, Russia can be like us. Uh, in, in many respects, this is a very naive approach to Russia, whereas the neighboring countries understand what they're facing, which is an aggressive state with now genocidal intentions in Ukraine. Yeah, do, do, you, know, do you see there's, this, uh, there's a contrast? Is there a contrast, really? Because we've heard tributes coming in from uh, the US, the UK, the UN, but, you know, coming in from Russia, where he was leader, we hear President uh, Putin speaking through his spokesperson and just, you know, uh, giving his, con his condolences and not really tributes. That's a really good point. It's important to think about the Russian reception and um, understanding of Gorbachev's legacy. On the one hand, um, he did bring about um, new freedoms, uh, and that cannot be denied. But recall how Putin's rhetoric about this war is so much based on humiliation, the humiliation of Russia, particularly in the 1990s, which was brought about by uh, the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, rather. Um, 
as we know, Putin has talked about the end of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Um, Gorbachev, therefore, was at the helm when this geopolitical catastrophe took place. Gorbachev didn't always have the kindest things to say about Putin, but he also um, uh, made sure to keep distance um, from the Kremlin. Although, as we saw in 2014, um, he backed the illegal annexation of Ukraine's autonomous Republic of Crimea by force. So this, again, this notion that he's an unmitigated advocate for peace is, is indeed very mixed. So this notion of humiliation that's powering a lot of Russian neo-imperial rhetoric um, is based in many respects on Gorbachev's failure to keep the Soviet Union intact. And this embrace of a, a new Soviet image for contemporary Russia, um, in many respects, is in opposition to Gorbachev's political legacy as it's seen in the West. So now you, you, you mentioned, you know, you touched on my next question. In 2014, he did agree with uh, Putin, you know, and he was against the NATO expansion in Ukraine. But what would you think would be his, uh, his thoughts now, even at this time when, you know, Ukraine is at war with Russia, Russia is at war with Ukraine, and the initial reason for this was because Ukraine, you know, was trying to join the uh, NATO alliance? It's important for us to think about Gorbachev in, in two ways. One is the, let's say, liberal political approach to Gorbachev and his legacy. I mentioned this naivete often in the West about him and other Russian political figures. That is, um, they seem to stand for democracy, although Boris Yeltsin was m much more of a leader for all his faults. Um, uh, along these democratic lines than Gorbachev ever was. Um, but we also see in Russian liberalism a tradition of imperialism. And when it came to um, the peripheral uh, Soviet republics like Lithuania, Ukraine, Latvia, etc., cetera, um, there's often been a chauvinistic view about their existence and their identity. And so I think Gorbachev, in many respects, may have been taken by these ideas himself. I mean, his reaction in 2014, highly disappointing if, if one is thinking about the architecture of global security. We, we can't have states taking territory and seizing territory of neighboring states by force. So um, I think that's a, a, a major difference we have to take into account when examining Gorbachev's legacy. But the other thing is to think about 2014 a little bit more. Recall that in 2014, in February when Crimea is annexed, later in the spring when the east of Ukraine is first uh, invaded by Russian forces, Ukraine is officially a neutral country. Um, in fact, the public support for joining NATO was a minority point of view. It's only later in 2014, after Crimea is annexed, after its east has been invaded by over 50,000 troops that are aligning with minority um, political figures, that is, those on the political extremes in eastern Ukraine, that alignment allows them to take various city halls in the area we call Donbass in eastern Ukraine. But it's important that it's only after all those things happen that Ukrainians decide that joining NATO would be a good idea. And, and how could we blame them when you're facing that type of aggression? So in our narrative about Gorbachev and Crimea, we often think about NATO as something that actually is precipitating um, that land grab. It really didn't. And the Kremlin has been using NATO um, as, a, as a boogeyman, but the facts um, and the chronology and the sources tell us otherwise. Uh, all right, Professor, let's uh, move on to uh, something else. The IAEA officials, uh, you know, on their way to the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear plant. You, you talked uh, in your first response uh, about, you know, the Chernobyl disaster. And we're looking at this uh, that we have in our hands. The nuclear plant, which happens to be Europe's biggest, is now under threat, you know, from Russian shelling. But the IAEA officials, uh, you know, on their way there to inspect, you know, to avoid radiation. Uh, disaster. It's a terribly perilous situation. We've talked about this on your program a, a couple of weeks ago. This is nothing less than nuclear terrorism being waged by the Russian Federation uh, on the entire world effectively. Um, it has, uh, we have intelligence and many sources that show 
that the Russian Federation has placed military material weaponry inside the plant itself, around the plant itself, and is shelling from the plant. Um, obviously, Ukrainian forces um, are not shelling back because they understand the stakes of what would happen if they did. Um, it would create a no-man's land in the country that they're seeking to uh, defend. It would cause the deaths, the illnesses of millions of people, not only in Ukraine, but across Europe. As we've seen with the Chernobyl disaster, it did not stay in Soviet Ukraine. The radiation um, expanded well across um, the European continent. So this is a terribly uh, perilous situation. Another indicator, really, of the links to which sometimes the Russian forces are willing to go, or at least uh, willing to threaten to go in these directions. Uh, we need to take them seriously. We need to understand that the Russian forces at this point aren't making much progress in the battle space. Um, they are not winning the war against Ukrainian forces. All they really have here is fear uh, and terrorism um, to, to frighten and terrify the uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, population, as well as all of us uh, around the world who are horrified by the brutality, but also horrified by the implications of this type of, of, of nuclear or radiation accident. All right, then we'll have to leave it at that. Associate Professor Rory Finnan from uh, on the Ukrainian studies in Cambridge, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Still ahead on the program. Bavarian State Premier Markus Soder says Germany has no answer to Putin's energy game right now. Welcome back to the program. European Union foreign ministers are likely to agree to suspend a visa facilitation agreement with Moscow and make Russians wait longer and pay more for their visas. Well, this is according to diplomats who said this on Tuesday while the bloc remained split over an outright EU travel ban. Eastern and Nordic countries strongly back a tourist visa ban and some have said they could go for a regional one if there's no agreement at the EU level. Speaking ahead of the EU foreign ministers meeting in Prague, Finnish foreign minister Pekka Havisto said there are no more and more tourist routes through Helsinki Vanta airports. Russian tourists began using Finland's Helsinki Vanta airport as a gateway to European holiday destinations following Russia's lifting of pandemic related border restrictions last month. Well, scores of cars with Russian license plates could be seen in the long stay car pack at Helsinki's airport. Finnish land border crossings have also remained among uh, the few entry points into Europe for Russians after a string of Western countries closed their airspace to Russian planes in response to Russia's attack on Ukraine. The uh, air connections have been cut. Uh, there's more and more this kind of tourist route through uh, Helsinki Vantaa airport, and uh, we are not looking that very favorable in the in the way in, in the situation when there is a war in Europe, uh, Russian aggression against the Ukraine, and we have been advocating this uh, postponement of this visa facilitation agreement that will hopefully, hopefully discussed here, and we have also done our national decision to limit the amount of the tourist visas to 10 percent of the current situation. We are discussing about the visa issues and, and uh, uh, probably the postponement of the visa facilitation agreement and, and we hope that uh, there is a unity on this issue here in the meeting. First of all, we do expect a serious decision and discussion about uh, the way how we are going to handle uh, visas, EU visas for Russian citizens. Uh, we will insist that uh, we discuss the option of banning issuing visas to Russian citizens. We have had 30 years of issuing visas to Russians, hoping that uh, this country is going to change. Actually, the country went to worse. Uh, about Iron Curtain, I think that this is not what the EU has put. This is the Russian Federation that has put the Iron Curtain already through its actions against Ukraine. What we want 
is very easy to express because it's only one word, which is peace. So I really do hope that here, when we enter this room, we will concentrate on decisions which will bring peace and we will not be faced with any kind of proposals which would escalate the war. So peace is our number one target, peace as soon as possible. And on your question, I don't think that the visa ban is an appropriate uh, decision under the current circumstances. The United Nations chartered ship carrying 23,000 metric tons of Ukraine grain arrived in East Africa on Tuesday and is bringing much needed food at a time when aid agencies are warning of farming in the region. The bulk carrier, M MV uh, Brave Commander, left Odessa, Ukraine on the 16th of August and arrived at the port of Djibouti after a two-week voyage. The UN's World Food Programme said the shipment would provide enough grain to feed 1.5 million people for a month and Ethiopia is set to be the main recipient. Officials hope the successful voyage will inspire private companies to begin shipping grain from Ukraine to Eastern Africa, by rising global food prices and difficulties raising donor funding that forced the UN to cut rations for refugees and displaced people. All among them are 150,000 Eritrean refugees that are sheltering in Ethiopia, many of whom have been repeatedly displaced by conflict in the north, and whose rations were cut in June to half to half the recommended amount of food. The food on the Brave Commander will feed 1.5 million people for one month in Ethiopia. So this makes a very big impact for those people who currently have nothing and now WFP will be able to provide them with their basic needs. We've already seen a reduction of 15% in wheat prices globally since the Black Sea Initiative commenced. What we want to see is more food flowing. We need, from WFP's perspective, millions of tons in this region. In Ethiopia alone, three quarters of everything that we used to distribute originated from Ukraine and Russia. Oh, for our second discussion on the program, we have joining us uh, Dr. Charles Omole, the DG Institute for Police and Security Police Research, joins us from Abuja. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for speaking to us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Uh, let's begin with uh, these, uh, the Russian visa ban that the EU is proposing. Well, some countries in the EU is proposing. Ukraine's uh, Kuleba, that's the foreign minister, is urging the EU to ban Russian tourists. But the European Union appears split on this uh, decision. What do you think is best? Would that be able to stop the war? Um, not necessarily. I think what you're seeing is a tension in Europe between sanctions against Russia and the uh, pressure to bring some uh, uh, leverage against Putin vis-a-vis -vis the impact on domestic economies. Many of these uh, countries rely on uh, Russian uh, tourists, you know, for you know, uh, lots of uh, their tourism income. So. Uh, apart from the traditional alliances of those who are pro-anti-Russia generally, uh, a bit of self-preservation is um, is being seen there. It's, it's a traditional way things work in Europe. I mean, initially when we were talking about gas, for example, banning Russian gas, you find that the countries that depended more on Russian gas were very reluctant to go down that route, whereas the countries that were not so much dependent who are very bellicose about banning the you know, Russian gas. Same way with tourism here. Countries that get very little or no Russian tourists, they don't, they, you know, there's no big issue for them. But for those who uh, are rely on that, they, they are more reluctant. I think, uh, I'm not quite sure how that will actually impact on, um, on the war, because the more Russians that come to the West, you know, you're looking at soft power, the more Russians maybe we can influence to see things differently. If you lock them up in their country, then they will only be able to uh, sort of uh, receive government propaganda from Russia, the information they get with purely uh, Putin's information. So there is a school of thought that say allowing them to come 
in, into Europe uh, gives them opportunity to see other other viewpoints and as well as um, other perspectives. Well, uh, a team from uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, that's the IAEA, a team from that uh, unit is on their way to Kyiv right now to inspect the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. What do, what would you, uh, you know, suggest should be their main focus in avoiding a nuclear disaster? Well, I mean, the major problem that, they, that we have is uh, actually the major problem the IE probably have is the ability, they don't trust Russia's assurances about the state of that plant. Uh, and I think uh, having independent eyes might probably be able to reassure the world that we are not on the brink of another nuclear disaster in that part of the, of, of, of the universe. So, so in a way, um, I think it's lack of trust. Uh, Russians have been saying that everything is fine, that, uh, you know, there's no problem, but uh, we don't know. We don't, we don't know whether we can trust that assurance in the first place. Uh, so the IAEA going probably will give the assurance needed to the world of the actual happenings within that plant. Well, you know, speaking about lack of trust that you said, Ukraine actually accuses Russia of uh, sh deliberately shelling the corridor that the officials, you know, would have taken, but now they would now have to travel through the Russian annex Crimea. But in all of this, peace is the target, like uh, the Hungarian uh, foreign minister said, just in the track before we uh, brought you on, peace is the target. But are we really close to achieving this? Uh, well, that's a difficult one. I mean, um, first of all, the IAEA mission to the to come and inspect the plant is supported by Russia, so it's not uh, so Russia is not against it. So uh, I, I, I'd be very curious as to why Russia would now would not facilitate their arrival at the plant since they support the inspection. Uh, but of course, the issue of going to the plant in the first place is a deliberate ploy by um, Russia. It's a standard, uh, it's a classic uh, sort of uh, technique during warfare. You go to a particular place where you know your opposition will less likely respond. It's like going to a, a top of a hospital and be launching missile from there. Clearly, if the other side respond, they are going to hit the hospital. So the news will be that the other side hit the hospital, not the fact that you are actually shooting your missile from the hospital in the first place. So it's almost like taking the plan to, you know, sort of into, into ransom, so to speak, uh, to make sure Ukrainians do not, uh, you know, respond as they should because of concern for uh, uh, the uh, collateral damage that could be done to the plant. So, so it's also sort of uh, uh, very uh, unprofessional or, or, or sort of um, move on the part of Russia to do that in the first place. Uh, but I doubt very much if Russia occupying the place will now be bombing the place as well. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, uh, I think in all of this, what I tell people is, take what Russia says, take what Ukraine says, the truth is a bit somewhere in the middle. I, mean, I think the idea that, that uh, Russia is always lying and Ukraine, Ukraine is always honest is wrong. Both of them are playing the information propaganda. And I think we need to know that the truth is somewhere in between their two positions. Indeed, you know, there have been accusations and counter accusations from Russia and Ukraine. But let's bring it down home now, uh, how it affects us here in Africa. The first uh, UN chartered ship that's carrying 23,000 metric tons of, you know, grain has arrived in Djibouti, arrived on Tuesday. This is a welcome development, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. It is. But of course, we also have to put every, uh, what just happened in perspective. Last year, that same port of Djibouti received one million, just over a million tons of grain from the Black Sea. Uh, and this year, this 23,000 tons is the first shipment that port is getting. So you can see that it's a very, very tiny uh, amount of uh, wheat compared to what is needed in that uh, region of Africa. But the, but the key thing, I think, is that I think what um, the UN who paid and sponsored this particular shipment, uh, what they are trying to achieve is really more to uh, reassure the private sector in that part of the world uh, by demonstrating that 
sheep can now move safely from the Black Sea to Djibouti, uh, more or less serving as a sort of um, uh, a, a, a sort of way of uh, encouraging them to now engage and go back to work and get more greens in through the private sector. So what the UN has done is purely a catalyst, I think, to uh, now help the private sector to reassure them. Because part of the problem is that when there's war like that, the, private, the, the shippers do not, they're unable to get insurance uh, for their product and their ships. So by demonstrating that it's safe enough to bring uh, a, a you know, ships in from the Black Sea to Djibouti, the expectation of the UN is that the usual private sector that imported hundreds of thousands of tons last year, we go back and bring more into Africa, but we do need it. Well, so do you see the expectation of the UN, you know, uh, coming to pass? Has this really, is this really a concrete assurance to the private companies? Well, I mean, hundreds of, uh, over 100 ships have left the, uh, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, since uh, this deal was struck uh, about uh, a month ago. And there has not been any negative incident yet to date. So I think that probably is some level of reassurance uh, uh, because Russia has signed on to it as well. Because Russia and Ukraine uh, are the two biggest supplier of green to the world. So um, I see that, yes, because UN cannot keep this up. Financially, it doesn't make sense to them to do so. Uh, and the private sector that usually bring in uh, the greens into Djibouti, uh, they've, all, they've been ready all year to do so. It's just that it doesn't mean safe to do so. So now, I think gradually, we will see a gradual increase in the number of greens that uh, you know get to Djibouti and then, of course, uh, they now distributed by land to the rest of um, the region. Well, uh, now that this uh, food is... Uh here and you know it's coming in its uh, in in bits and do you see uh, probably an amelioration of uh, the how do I put it now I'm trying to I'm trying to say how this would affect you know it's there's been an, a great impact on people especially in countries that uh, the UN the World Food Program have been saying you know they need food but do you see this bringing soccer? Well, well, every little helps. It will bring some help, but the, 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 let's mix, mix this up. The, the 23,000 grains, uh, tons of grains that uh, UN brought in, it's not going to end up in, in shelves and shops in Ethiopia, in any of the East African countries. It's purely to help the extreme, extremely poor and the refugees in that region. Uh, uh, so, and the entirety of uh, that region, they, they are experiencing major drought at the moment from uh, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, you know, Djibouti. Uh, of course, the case is a bit worse in Ethiopia. That's why Ethiopia has been prioritized. But the entire region need this. But I don't see this as uh, helping the man on the street to be able to go to shops to get anything made with grain. I think it's gonna be more distributed by the United Nations Food Program in the usual way they give aid to the extremely poor and for those who are in camps and who are displaced. But in terms of the man on the street, uh, this will not make any difference to them yet. But we hope that with more ships coming in, uh, you know, based on the trigger of this successful uh, birthing at uh, Djibouti, as more grains come in, then we hope that now they will be able to see the difference in shops and prices will begin to be lowered across the continent. All right, then, Dr. Charles Somole, DG Institute for Police and Security Policy Research. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Well, Bavaria's leader says Germany's current problem is that it has no adequate answer to Russian President Vladimir Putin's game with energy. Uh, the leader said this as he visited the site of a planned floating liquid natural gas terminal on the Baltic Sea coast. According to him, uh, he said at a news conference, Premier Marcus Sider, that the task ahead of us is try to inject as much natural gas as possible. A fifth flowing LNG terminal will be built in Germany by a private consortium in addition to the four already planned by the government. And that was according to the country's economy ministry last month. Well, the fifth terminal to be located in 
Lubim, about 250 kilometers north of Berlin, is expected to be built by the end of this year. Lubim and Stad, near Hamburg, were also announced by the ministry in July as the sites of two of the planned government terminals. Well, those sites, part of Germany's strategy to win itself off Russian energy as quickly as possible, are uh, in addition to two in Wilhelmshaven and Bronzebottle that were already announced. The floating terminals are essentially liquefied gas tankers uh, that can return the fuel to its gas state themselves, which means a complete port is not required. Still to come on the program. Well, Kiev ravers temporarily escape the horrors of war through music and dance. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez are pushing for the Iberian Peninsula to be connected to the European electricity and gas grid. Well, Sanchez says that Spain, which holds 30% of the EU's regasification capabilities, could help Europe more if a pipeline existed. Well, Mr. Scholz also supports this pipeline, saying sun rich countries had surpluses that they could export. Spanish Energy Minister Teresa Rivera had previously said that the emphasized gas pipeline connection between Spain and France could be operational in less than a year. The prerequisite is that France and the EU agree on the project. Well, Spain has the most liquefied natural gas terminals in Europe and also a pipeline from producer Algeria. However, there is no major connection to France and a project was abandoned years ago because, or because it was uneconomical with the help of the EU, it ex it's expected to be revived. A Russian energy giant Gazprom says that it will completely suspend gas supplies to French industrial energy group NG this week due to a contract dispute amid concerns of a potential energy crisis in Europe this winter. In a statement on its official Telegram channel, Gazprom said at the close of business on August 30th, Gazprom export did not receive full payment for gas supplied to NG in France in July under the existing contracts. Or well, the Gazprom statement adds that the Russian law prohibits the country's natural, natural gas supplies to Supply further deliveries of gas to foreign buyers if payment has not been made in full by the buyer within the contractual term. Gazprom adds that it has, not notif it has notified rather, NG of a complete suspension of gas deliveries beginning from September 1st until full payment for the gas supplies has been received. Well, Ine John Mekwa, our business correspondent, joins me now in the studio to unpack all of this. Hello, Ine. Hi. So France has not been able, according to Gazprom, has not been able to pay uh, for this, <laughs> and now they've suspended yes. the gas supplies to, to yes. the French industrial. Yeah. So it's not just group. it's not just France, uh, and 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 I think that's why um, a lot of the European countries uh, say that uh, most of these things are just like gimmicks and things like that, because apart from France not being able to get because they say in their, in their cases uh, something to do with the contract and the payment and all of that. And of course, we do remember that Gazprom had asked that they should open rubles accounts and a lot of the European countries have refused to do that. Now, from uh, today, uh, uh, um, Gazprom is also going to shut off Germany, they're not going to get supplies anymore for the next three days until Saturday, and the says maintenance. Now, if you remember that there was a turbine that was sent to Canada some time ago, you know, that also stopped supplies to Germany and yes. some other countries. And so that's why Germany is saying, I don't understand. I mean, you just <laughs> finished one maintenance. Why do you have another maintenance so, soon, so soon? You know, and, and for just three days, for three days, you're not able to do it. So it, it does look like Russia is actually trying to win 
of the European countries before they are even ready. You to, know, they, to, yeah, yeah, you know, they had set the end of the year, but it looks like uh, Russia is really working on uh, getting them off. But I guess one of the confidence that Russia has is one of the things we discussed with Ladi yesterday was the the alternative that Russia has. For instance, Afghanistan, the Taliban's have been talking to Russia, Russia. about buying their oil. So it seems all these uh, boosts because we have talked about the revenue that Russia stands to lose by the time uh, Europe prop, uh, totally wins off uh, its oil and gas. You know, I think the oil is off, the coal is off. The gas is supposed to be off later. So uh, Russia seems to have a lot of ally, or not a lot of ally, but at least some strong ally. If they have Afghanistan, they have India, they have China. Uh, we do know that for China, for instance, their, their import of uh, Russian oil has gone about 40 percent. So it seems <laughs> Russia still has a market, and that's why they can confidently, uh, you know, do all of this they're doing to France, to Germany, Germany. and some of those uh, European countries. Indeed, Russia knows what it is doing. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ini our Thanks business correspondent. Having... Well, let's move to our sports stories on the program. Ukrainian, Ukrainian handball champions, HC Moto Zaporizhia, are uh, training in Dusseldorf after joining Germany's second division for the 2022-2023 season. As war rages on back home, the players alternate daily between training sessions and worried calls to their relatives. They believe sports is helping them cope at the moment and focusing on practice is the only way to take their minds off what's currently going on in their country. For example, for me, sports help uh, in this, uh, at this moment uh, because you focus on your practice and sometimes your mind uh, relaxes some some days but unfortunately we have a situation when you can't uh, think about your home my team now feel uh, full power before this game because we know uh, that will be a great time for ukrainian for ukrainian people to show the world that we are strong and we, we will play uh, on this hall on this place on this uh, game <laughs> So I think for my team and my uh, national nationality, it's very uh, important game and important time. Well, exiled Belarusian sprinter Kristina Simanuskaya has said she's looking forward to competing without any problems after winning her battle to secure a Polish citizenship. Simanuskaya was at, a set, at the center of a big scandal at last year's Olympics in Tokyo when she claimed to have been forcibly taken to the airport against her will following pop public criticism of her Belarus coaches. Well, the incident sparked global concern for Simanuskaya, while Belarus athletics head coach Yuri Musevich and team official Arthur Schumach were expelled from the Games by the International Olympic Committee in response to the allegations. Well, Simanuskaya was granted her, a humanitarian visa by Poland. She sought asylum and has attempted to switch allegiances. On the program, parties rarely end with a DJ destroying a barrel painted in the colors of a neighboring country. But this is the reality for Ukraine's electronic music scene as you try to keep the beat going through the war. Well, before the invasion, Ukraine's capital Kyiv was becoming a top European nightlife destination. Well, now its young creatives are beginning to rebuild a cultural fabric that's been devastated by conflict and they're gathering donations for the armed forces on the front lines. That's trying to make the best of the situation, whatever you find yourself in. Well, that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm Layo Alangi.